Well, friends, thank you for uh, being part of this ongoing telethon here, the Weber and Mark Inquisition. And the title of this telethon takes its name uh, based on the Lewis and Clark expedition, which uh, most of you know from your history classes were recording artists for Cold Gems Records in 1967, 68. Uh, a couple of singles, a full length album that included a band that included um, Owen Castleman and uh, Michael Martin Murphy, uh, John London stand in on the Monkeys TV series, good friend of Mike Nesmith's and later member of the First National Band. And also Kenneth Bloom, who is uh, we're going to introduce as our next guest in just just a moment here. So uh, Kenneth. So, so being being a Cold Jumps recording artist, there there were not a lot of cold, besides the Monkees, obviously, uh, Sajid Khan. There was a there were kind of a handful, um, and so Lewis and Clark were uh, kind of riding the you know the the, the coattails of the Monkees, as it were, that uh, getting some of that uh, firepower from Cold Gems to help uh, get that first album out and stuff like that. Kenneth also um, played on some key Monkees recording sessions, as was mentioned uh, earlier in the show, and. Today is a Bode Dulcimer uh, builder and player and enthusiast who lives uh, very close to you there, Lee. In uh, yeah, that's right. Um, I'm down here in uh, Charlotte, which is uh, kind of in the Western Piedmont. And, and Kenneth, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you live uh, up north more near the uh, Virginia state line. Um, uh, I had first heard, heard, became aware of you um because a friend of mine said she was taking dulcimer lessons or her sister was going to take dulcimer lessons and uh, her name was uh, sarah sprinkle uh, oh. Smith. and yeah. she uh so she's a co-worker of mine occasionally and she had, had mentioned that she had, had met you and that you had played on some monkey records and i'm i'm always skeptical because i always thought that i know everybody's name that ever played on anything but by the monkeys and and sure enough i looked it up and and, and there you were so that was kind of that was a while ago a good 10 years ago or so but uh Right. Well, uh, uh, Rachel Sprinkle became one of my very best students. I built her a bow dulcimer. We played a lot of music together. And um, the whole monkeys thing was this major production. And everybody in Hollywood was working. You know, I mean, uh, Ravels and Schneider came up with this idea, let's take Hard Day's Night, make a TV series out of it, and we'll sell a ton of records. And they did. And so um, I was basically, let's see, how did this go? Mike and Boomer signed with Coal Gems. And I had already been playing music with Mike. And we started doing a few things, a few recording things. I had done a fair bit of work for Jack Nietzsche from another group that I had been in that was produced by him. They saw He saw that I played a bunch of different instruments and started hiring me to do the odd session now and again. And then um, uh, once Lewis and Clark was signed to Coal Gems, and I was around the office a lot and I got to know those people. Basically, I was on staff um, doing demo sessions. Uh, I would come in in the morning and they'd tell me, okay, be at this studio at such and such time and um, bring these following instruments and, and like that. Uh, we did a, lot, did a lot of work at Original Sound, which in the days of half inch tape and eight track had a, what was it, a 15 track machine which was great for, for demos. And um, uh, one of the best things I got to do was uh, work, work uh, a lot of those with Carol King. Uh, she had just moved out to LA and was just one of the most delightful people you'd ever want to work with. I mean, just consummate professional, just a pleasure to do things with. So I would go in and I'd do the basic tracks and if they needed horn parts, I put horn parts down and like that. Um, the monkeys thing, studios were going like 24 hours a day. And a lot of times they would put music in front of us that didn't even have names. They often had just numbers. And uh, we got calls to do sessions at every hour of the day and night you might think of. I mean, it just was 
constant. Wow. And then, so, so, Kenneth, can you share the story about the, I guess, the, the head soundtrack? You know, you got that call. Um... Oh, uh, okay. Um, I was sitting home at night. It was about eight o'clock. And I had a nine o'clock call at Glen Glen Sound to do the sitar parts for the pilot of Mod Squad, my big claim to fame there. And um, Nietzsche gives me a call and says, hey, Bloom, you want to do a session? I said, sure. What time? He said, uh, one o'clock. I said, that's perfect. I got to be at Glen Glen at nine o'clock. And then I can get some lunch and come over and do this. He said, no, 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 no one o'clock this morning it's for the monkey movie uh, all right what the hell so he hired me to play the vena which is an indian instrument uh the only vena players in the union book were me and al wilson and al was on the road with canned heat so i had custody of the vena at the time so, uh, and we had agreed between us, if we got a call for a Vena session, double scale. They said, fine, <laughs> you know, who's gonna call? <laughs> Nietzsche. So I said, well, you know, it's double scale. He said, that's fine, that's fine. We've got plenty of budget here. And by the way, bring along, and he had me bring along three other instruments. So it was a Sunday night and i get to the studio at one you know five to one right so i'm ready to go nobody's there one o'clock the engineer walks in the thing goes all night long um and finally i said okay jack i gotta leave i gotta go clean up i've got to go home get the sitar get the clean you know fine it's great we're done you know great okay so it was sunday night which was extra it was double scale for Vena, which was lots extra. Every other instrument I played was an additional percentage because it was straight union session. And the checks were two weeks late. So by the time I got the check, I forget how much it was, but to us at the time, my wife and I were just newly together and it was like an astronomical amount. So we paid our bills and we drove up to Solvang for a second honeymoon. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> and then about, God, what was this? Maybe eight or nine years ago, I get a call on the electric telephone for this, uh, this woman says, I'm from the uh, secondary market special payments fund. Are you the Kenneth Bloom that played on and listed a bunch of stuff? And I said, yeah, that's me. Oh, we're holding a bunch of money for you. Is this your right address? We need to send you some checks. I said, yeah, that's it. And I think the first check was like $10,000. And the second one was six. And the third one was three. You see where this is going. So now I get, I, I think the last one, now I get checks for like two or 300. And it's from this, uh, this monkey stuff that the tunes themselves, I don't remember. The volume of the stuff was tremendous. It was huge. There was so much of it. Um, and uh, so, you know, at, after all this time, who remembers this stuff? Because uh, I did, I, you know, I was making my living doing studio work at the time. And the, in 68, when the bottom fell out, there was, I forget why now, but all of a sudden, all of us second, third, and fourth call players were not no longer doing anything. So uh, I went down to San Diego and stayed there for two and a half years, came back and played with Linda Ronstadt for a while. Um, so those are my various claims to fame here of the, uh, of the Hollywood version. <laughs> Very, very cool. And you were there, like you mentioned, uh, the Murphy Castleman, the the original woodshedding session for What Am I Doing Hanging Around as the song's kind of being trotted out. You, you, you said you would have been there on the ground floor, right? Well, you know, when we got together, usually at Murphy's house, and uh, he'd had, usually he and Boomer had gotten together and 
rough something out and bloom what do you think about this and what do you think you want to play on it and and like that because at the time with lewis and clark i was playing mostly lead guitar but i was also playing sax and clarinet and flute and uh i made myself this electric uh i called it the electric vena which uh, was a cobbled together thing that i could play as if it were a vena with a pickup on it and uh so yeah i would i'd say well i'll probably do this and this and then maybe that maybe switch to something else in the bridge and and like that um it was it was so much like getting together with everybody else who was floating around hollywood in those days you'd get together in people's living rooms and play tunes and it's no different from what people do here now except now instead of playing the latest country and bluegrass hits as you're sitting around the living room now i wrote this yesterday what do you think you can contribute to it and and like that and um uh, uh, I've worked over the years with plenty of singer-songwriters doing similar types of things. Uh, when I was doing all the Canadian folk festivals in the 70s, uh, I often got drafted as the backup guitar player for whoever the singer-songwriter was. And a lot of times I wouldn't, we wouldn't have any rehearsal. I'd just get thrown on stage with them and, and play through the changes. You know, it was really pretty, pretty straightforward stuff to do from my point of view. Um, so it's not as different as people might think, you know, what can I say? It's not like they've read in People magazine. <laughs> it's a lot more, there's a lot more real life to this. Um, when I was when when we were living in Beechwood Canyon, when I was the time when both well, before I was playing with Linda, up the up the street from us was this duplex. Doug Dillard lived downstairs. Linda lived upstairs. Harry Dean Stanton lived in the back. Um, there were a bunch of people all lived around there, and we would get together at Doug's to play music. And uh, and Linda would cook. We throw, you know, nobody had any money. We threw money together, and the girls would go out and get uh, get food and best Mexican food I've ever had in my life. <laughs> it was wonderful, but it was very relaxed, you know. Um, Ninety nine percent of the people of the musicians that I met were just, you know, really nice, great people, and we were all doing everything we could to scratch out a living. Cool, cool. Do you have any John London memories per se? Because uh, you were a bandmate with him, and then John went on to play in the first national band with Michael. John had uh, John and Mike Nesmith were like best friends, and they came out to San Antonio together. And uh, the deal was, whoever made it first would take care of the other one. So when Nesmith got the Monkees call. Uh, that year, Nesmith got a Buick Riviera for his birthday. And that was kind of, that was our upscale gig wagon for a while, you know. Um, John was a really relaxed, fun kind of guy, you know. There was nothing uptight about him at all. Um, he was just really pleasant to be around, good bass player. Um, it was through him that I met Nesmith and, uh, the w one day I got a call from Michael and he says, hi, I've just got back from Fullerton and I went down and I got these three pedal steels from them. Do you know how to set them up? And I said, sure. They're a cable system. It's not a big deal. So yeah, well, why don't you come up the house and, and would you do that for me? I said, sure. So I went up there. And I set them up and they were a real, not the greatest of pedal steels, you know, on a good pedal steel, you can step on a pedal and change four or five strings if you want. You can make some go up and some go down, things like this. The fenders had a cable system. 
the cable's got two ends, so you can hook it up to two strings and figure it out, figure it out how to, you know, how much you wanted to move them. But the, the pedal action was awful on them. I mean, it was like like driving a truck. And I asked Michael, I said, Michael, what do you need three of these things for? He says, well, this one I'm giving to the road crew. Uh, this one here I'll put in the studio and uh, I don't know. What? You take the third one. And I said, all right. <laughs> okay, I'll take it. Came in these two cases and it weighed a bloody blue ton. So I set it up in the living room and I played it for a little while, but it was, like I say, it was really uncomfortable to play. But the best part of it was uh, our cat would sit up on the E9 neck and paw at strings on the C6 neck. So I had a steel playing cat. <laughs> and when we got ready to leave LA, I just took it back to him because, you know, it just took up a lot of space and it was heavy and it really wasn't playable as a musical instrument, really. I don't, I don't know any professionals who ever, ever played one of those things. You know, they all play an Emmons or a Showbud or something like that. You know, something that, a musical instrument, you know, that you can play. <laughs> right, right. So you never got to auction off your Michael Nesmith pedal steel. You returned it to. No, you know, there's so many things I, I wish I still had, you know. I bought my 1954 Gold Top Les Paul for 350 bucks, and when I sold it for 450, I thought I'd made a killing. And I won't even talk about the the Gibson 335 that I bought new again for 250 bucks. Um, I think I traded that one. Uh, about the only bit of old gear I still have is my old Ampeg Reverbo Rocket amplifier which sounds as good now as it did then. So it's, it's a great jazz amp basically. And which is what I would, why I like it. Cool, cool. Um, I know there, we have some Lewis and Clark expedition uh, super fans who are certainly tuning in and uh, you know, how much push did you guys actually get? Like there's, there's stories of you playing in Atlanta and no one's showing up. Like you guys, like just sort of tough times kind of getting the push from coal gems that you kind of really deserved. It was that, how was it for you guys? It was, we did this, we did this tour. It was basically a promotional tour and they had us playing in some pretty strange places. I forget in Atlanta, it was some kind of convention of some sort that we played. I mean, the radio, the uh, uh, record execs whined and dined us. You know, we had we had nice flights on the planes. Uh, I forget whether it was either Atlanta or Detroit where they took us to a fancy restaurant and I had my first real Caesar salad where they make it at the table for you and they break the egg and they do all that stuff. Um, and they did when we first came out, they they did a lot of print uh, promotional stuff, which probably nobody saw outside of Hollywood, but, you know, impressed the pants off of me saying, oh, look, they're doing this, you know? And um, basically, you know, Cold Gems Records was put together for the monkeys. You know, that's why Screen Gems even bothered doing that, because they're a publishing company. So they, uh, what was his name? Don, who ran it? Oh, don't remember his last name. He'd hate that. Uh, anyway, um, the company was formed to, for the monkeys. And they signed us with, I think with the, my guess was the idea of, of we're not just for the monkeys, we're a real record company and we had this band. And I don't think they ever signed anybody else that I was aware of. Um, and we got, you know, I think maybe that's why uh, me and, and John, you know, the drummer, Honig, uh, why they gave us so much work doing demos and doing sessions and stuff like that, because they wanted to, to hang on to us and not see us float away somewhere else. But who knows what goes on in the minds of record execs? You know, I um, uh, that's always been kind of a mystery to me. It took me a long time to understand 
that there's music and there's the music business and they're real different. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in my twenties and I'm thinking about, oh, we're going to make great art, you know, <laughs> forget that. All I wanted to do was they wanted to make great money and I wanted to pay my rent and, and, and stuff. So, um, there's just a, there's, a, there's so many misconceptions about all that stuff. Um, and, uh, it was a great experience. I'm glad I did it. Don't have any regrets. Met a lot of nice people. I get emails every once in a while from people saying, you know, I saw you, uh, saw you when, when you were doing Lewis and Clark, or I saw you at a Canadian folk festival in 1977, or I heard what you did on Stan Rogers album or, 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 or. And, you know, I get those things. It makes you feel good, you know, that, that you're doing stuff. Now, I spend all my, most of my time building instruments. I'm back ordered a year on Bo Dulcimers. Uh, we just got done reviving the Pilot Mountain Bo Dulcimer Festival and had people coming in from all over for that. Um, and uh, and that's, that's expanding. I've, I've gotten three orders for instruments in the last week and a half, you know, I mean, just amazing to me, uh, the way it, the way it goes like that. And, um, so that's been very satisfying. Um, I get to, I've, I've got some people here locally that I can get to play a lot of the, the things that I want to play. So I'm not just playing, you know, uh, country music and bluegrass. Uh, when I first moved, moved, to, moved to North Carolina, I uh, met a woman down in Chapel Hill, Jane Pepler, and we play a ton of Balkan music, klezmer music, uh, Ukrainian stuff, which I'm well acquainted with. I'm doing a two hour workshop on Ukrainian music, culture, and history at this festival that's coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, so, you know, I'm busy. <laughs> Absolutely. It sounds very exciting. I know just, uh, this has been a, a wonderful journey, Ken, and, uh, got it, got it. would be remiss of me if I didn't ask, where were you when you first heard Oklahoma backroom dancer? I have no idea. Okay. Okay. No idea. So much of all that stuff from back then is just a blur. I worked with a lot of singer songwriters, uh, both in LA and also up north in San Francisco. Um, Steve Young, uh, played a lot with him. There were just a ton of people. Same thing in Chicago. I worked with a lot of people there. Um, so I've been sort of a, uh, you know, there are some people who know who I am. And it's it's sort of a bizarre but select group. Uh, I'm starting to connect I mean, since the since the Russian invasion. I've started to connect with a lot of my Ukrainian friends, uh, which is wonderful. Slava Ukraini, um, and um, you know between all all that you know it all kind of comes home to roost after a while. So. Uh, because the, uh, the Hollywood experience was, you know, basically I, I was done with it by se by the end of 71 and, uh, except for running into people on the road once in a while, I was teaching in New York, um, in the eighties and I'm walking down 57th street and I hear somebody yell, Hey, boom, and I turn around as Glenn Fry. Because I, 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 that he was part of the band I was in with uh, backing up Linda, and we had known each other before when he was working with uh, with John, and um, uh, you know it was great to see him, catch up with him. You know, he was a good guy. He's always always had been a good guy. He was never a jerk. Um, 
And so I'm lucky. Most of the people I know were just lovely people. <laughs> right on, right on. Um, now, before we get to the kind of close on the bullet dulcimer, because this is uh, your your passion, and and for a lot of us, this will be an introduction. But I did want to ask you um, uh, your favorite monkey. Ah, uh, um, well, it'd have to be Nesmith, just because I knew him the best. I knew him before the monkeys, and um, you know, and like I say, he was just a real down to earth kind of guy what you see is what you get and um and i spent i had spent a lot more time around him than any of the others um i knew davy and mickey kind of in passing you know we'd see each other in the studio we'd see each other at the screen gems office hi how are you but michael michael i knew i'd been up to his house and you know, we knew each other socially and like that. I knew him from before when he was running the hoots at the Troubadour. And um, those are the days when he could stand in his, in his apartment and stand in the middle of the living room and touch all four walls, you know, and then his life changed. <laughs> and the thing is, he was always a really good songwriter. He was always a great songwriter. And, you know, you hear so many stories about people being jerks and divas in the business. And when you meet people who are just down to earth and nice folks, that needs to be said. And he's def he definitely one of those. Cool, cool. Do you remember his big German Shepherd dogs? Wasn't there like a dog named Frack? Yeah. Um, when I went to the house, he kind of, the, the dog wasn't roaming about. So I think he, uh, uh, he's, I have a feeling that that dog is like my dog who is intensely friendly, but also 80 pounds. And that friendliness can be a little overwhelming if you're not, you know, 180 pounds. Right, not, not the dog on your lap there though. Yeah, this is the other dog. Okay. This is Mr. Winston, he doesn't <laughs> weigh 80 pounds. Yes, you, yes, you're sweet. Yes, you're cute. Yes, you're a Bichon. Hit the road. Wave bye bye. Bye bye. Okay. That was awesome. Okay, so you you said you would give us a just a little brief tutorial in uh, bow dulcimer. Okay. Um, bowing the dulcimer, I can document it back to the 15th century in Europe and the 18th century in this country. Um, I did a, I produced an album with a woman named Lois, Lois Hornbostel, who's well known in the dulcimer world. And they wanted me to play on the album. And I thought, well, I can't play any better on this instrument than you got what you guys are doing, but I can maybe bow something. And we were staying at Jeff Furman's house. His wife is a fabulous violinist and fiddler. And so I borrowed a bow, played it on the record, Sounded terrible, but I thought, what a good idea. I, maybe I could build something that would sound better. So uh, this is what I built. This is now the bow dulcimer. And it has, at one time, it looked more like a regular dulcimer. Now it's more like a, more like a gamba and a cello. And in fact, it... <laughs> and it plays in a very cello-like manner. It's the easiest bowed instrument to play. That being said, you still have to deal with the bow, which um, takes some intestinal fortitude for people to get past the vagaries of doing the bow here. So uh, let me play you a little, little bit on here just to close out with. Um, this has kind of become a bow dulcimer anthem. Um, there was a man by the name of Tom Anderson in the Shetland Islands. He had been on the mainland for about 20 years. His wife had passed away and he was returning to his home island of Eshinus. The ferry came in at night and he noticed there were far fewer lights on in the town than when he left. And that's because all the young people were moving away. 
And that was the inspiration for this tune that I'm going to play, which is called the Slocket Light. There's a lot of Norse words in the Shetland dialect, and Slocket means extinguished. So this is the extinguished light. Good part about this story was after he moved back to the Shetlands, he instituted a program of teaching fiddle in the schools on the islands so that the Shetland fiddle style, which is rather unique, would be preserved. And a lot of great players came out of that system. Uh, the most famous is Ali Bain. But anyway, here's uh, just lock at light. <laughs> Wonderful. Kenneth Bloom, thank you ever so much for that performance and for your reflections. It's been great having you as our um, one of our special guests here on the telethon. So all well, the best to you. And Lee, do you have anything to add or your neighbor down the road there in no. Charlotte? No, uh, just thanks again. I really appreciate your time. Maybe I hope, hope to get to you play live sometime. That'd be great. Um... Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. Nice, nice to do the little walk down memory lane. All right. Blessings. All the best.